I was in a mom and pop shop a couple of months ago and got into a conversation and befriended the shop owner. He was born in another country on the other side of the globe and we were talking about what it was like for him to adjust to American culture when he arrived. And he said, to me, the problem with America is that there's no order. He said, in my country, if somebody stole a pack of gum from this shop, they would get their hand chopped off. Here, we keep not having any big consequences. You get warnings, you get, you get misdemeanors. He said, that's the problem. And, you know, depending on the kind of situation you've been in lately, or maybe the, the number of times you've been wronged by somebody, or the frustration that you have with society, you may say, I find myself sometimes saying, you know, maybe, maybe they've got a bit of a point there. You know, maybe that would, that would get things in order. And then, and then you can start to think, wait a minute, I think I've even heard about this in the Bible. Doesn't the Bible say an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth? And the truth is, yes, that actually is in the Bible. But to understand it, you need a little bit more context. A lot of things in the Bible are like that. The reason that we were taught an eye for an eye is because of the human tendency when you get hit to want to hit back harder. And people were giving all sorts of excessive punishments to other people. The exact reason why the Bible says an eye for an eye is so that you don't get your hand chopped off for taking a pack of gum. It's for that exact reason. So the idea is there ought to be a punishment, but it's got to match the crime. So you steal a pack of gum from my store, I get your lip balm and your earbuds because you shouldn't have done it. But I don't chop your hand off. That would be so excessive. Gandhi, perhaps, is the one who explained the problem with this the best. He said, if you have an eye for an eye, eventually, because of how people are, we'll all be blind. We're all going to wind up blind if we do an eye for an eye because you're going to mess up, I'm going to mess up, other people are going to mess up, we're all going to wind up blind. And that's one of the reasons why the readings today are so powerful, starting with that first reading about David, because he refuses to do an eye for an eye, even though he would be on good ground if he did. He'd be well within his rights. He'd be having an act of self-defense, really. Saul, who's the king, has all of these forces allied against David. He's jealous of David, and he wants to kill him. But he's not as good a warrior as David is. Now, the reason for that is actually something you probably know. Sometimes you might wonder, is that the same David as the kid with the slingshot and Goliath? It is. When he was a kid, he slew Goliath. Then he grew up, and eventually after this, he becomes the king of Israel for 40 years, one of the most famous people in the world of all of history. But he's an interesting guy because he had lots of sins. David was a pretty serious sinner. If I say the name Bathsheba, maybe you know what I mean by that. That one story alone involves adultery and murder. So he was a very serious sinner. But because of things like tonight's, today's story, we see why David is so held up as the great model for us all. He has the chance to kill Saul, and because he's a better warrior than Saul, he has snuck into his camp while he's sleeping. He's gotten around all the security around him, and he's got a chance to kill him. And he decides not to. Even though Saul is so aggressive and he's so unfair and guilty, he won't do it. Because an eye for an eye is human justice. And he is wanting to put himself in the flow of God and be part of God's system of justice. The thing is, if we think that human justice is the be-all and the end-all, then this story really doesn't make sense. It just looks like David got soft. He wasn't man enough to do it. He was weak. But that's not what this story is about at all. It's about his strength. Because justice 
is an important part of life. It's why that shopkeeper saying the laws about his own country and putting them up on a pedestal, that's why that a little bit appeals to us, because justice is an important human value. But it's not the highest. Mercy is higher than justice. The way that some theologians have said it is, in the, in the book of life, there's a whole chapter on justice, but the name of the book is mercy. Justice serves mercy. In fact, you may have seen, maybe you've even read, the book that Pope Francis wrote recently called The Name of God is Mercy. You can't understand God if you can't understand mercy. And that's why at the beginning of every Mass, we say, Lord, have mercy. Why do we do that? Why is that a tradition that every single time we gather? Lord, have mercy. And if you pay attention to it, it's all about owning that we all have sins and that if, if it was up to an eye for an eye, we would be down an eye this week, would have been plucked out. And, and it's an amazing thing because like soon in Lent, we're going to go to the other version of that for the season of Lent. It's called the confidier, where you say, I confess to Almighty God and to all of you. So pray for me. Pray for me, brothers and sisters. I ask the Blessed Virgin Mary. I ask all the angels and saints, and I ask you to pray for me to the Lord our God. It's because we want to admit from the beginning that we know the truth, that we need mercy, that we haven't had a good week. And we ask each other for mercy because a lot of the things we did this week, the lousy things, they were right here in town. They were to a waitress at Gourmet Cafe, or they were at a gas pump, or they were in the line at Walmart, or wherever else. So we say, brothers and sisters, I need your mercy too. It's almost like what happens in a 12-step meeting where they go around the table and somebody says, I'm Charlie and I'm an alcoholic. I'm Sally and I'm an alcoholic. We're all just getting honest with each other. I need mercy. I need mercy too. The thing about the way God bestows mercy is that the story of David and Saul helps us to see what God is aiming at. It's that we will treat the guilty just as well as we treat the innocent. That we will treat our enemies as well as we treat our friends. It's, it's a high bar, but it's the way God works. The church has done a really good thing for us in making sure that all of our doctrines have this mercy woven into it. You know, for example, the church teaches that every stage of human life is sacred, from the womb to the tomb, every stage. There's no stage that you get to veto human life. But it applies equally to all humans and all stages of life. So that means a lot of us find it easy to want to defend innocent life. But as the scripture says, but what credit is that to you? Sinners defend innocent life. How about defending guilty life? To say, even people who are guilty of terrible crimes, we will not execute them. That's what the church has always taught. Because it's important that we not only bestow mercy on the innocent, that's easy, but on the guilty, the way that Christ did, dying for the guilty. Because God is so connected to mercy, because the name of God is mercy, we can bring beauty to any situation by bringing mercy there. I remember reading in the New York Times a few years ago something that I cut out so that I would remember it. Very simple story, actually. A man in the Midwest was going to his godmother's funeral, and he was driving to that funeral, which was in Nebraska. While he was in Iowa, his car broke down in a town he'd never been in before. He called AAA, and they towed him to a mechanic, and the mechanic looked at the car and said, I can fix this, but I won't have the part I need until tomorrow. So he was going to miss the funeral for his godmother. So the mechanic said, I can promise you I will work on this and I will get this car fixed tomorrow. And in the meantime, he handed him his keys. Take my truck to your godmother's funeral, 75 miles away. You know the feeling that you have right now? That's God. That's God. That's what it's like to be in the presence of God. Just a little taste of that, and you experience that. 
And you know how you feel when you're watching the news and you're mad as heck and you're... That's not God. That's the opposite feeling. Whenever there's mercy, that's when you're encountering God. And and that, that mechanic was incredibly merciful, but he's also smart. Because if we, if we listen to this gospel, we hear the measure with which you measure is going to come back to you. He's smart to do something generous for that guy because he's going to need a hand at some point. And that, that primes the pump. He can be sure that someone will be merciful to him somewhere down the line. In the East, they call that karma. And Jesus says, yeah, that's how it works. It'll come back to you. It always does. And a lot of us only think about that in terms of an eye for an eye, but it works the other way. That if you are generous, if you tip that waitress today, some big fat tip, you're smart because it's going to come back to you. An eye for an eye was to stop us from hitting back harder than we got hit. It was never the ultimate solution. God wants things to be fair, but the name of God is not fairness. The name of God is mercy.